is power and peril. <laughs> Usually we think that if we have power, it eliminates the risk in our life because we can control the things that are going on around us. Most of us equate power with control. But can I tell you today that when the power of God is at work, you're not in control. Now, I know what the Bible says, that the spirit of the Lord is subject to the prophet. I understand. I'm not talking about the function of a spiritual gift that you may have. That is definitely directed by the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of the Lord is subject to the prophet. We can we can function in that the right way. We, at no time do we lose control. People will say, well, you know, I was just overwhelmed with the Spirit of God. Yes, absolutely. But God does not go against his own principles and God does not go against his word. And, and can I just tell you today that while there are times in our life that God uses us in powerful ways, at no time are you ever without the ability to think and perceive what's going on. God created you with that ability. He's not going to do something to, to do the opposite of that. You guys with me? But when it comes to the work of God, when it comes to what God does in our life, can I tell you that you are not in control? <laughs> you look at the person next to you and would you just remind them uh, you're not in control would you just let them know some of y'all have been waiting to do that for years you you've been wanting to tell that person you're not in control for years just go ahead and tell them you're not in control and here's one just even more fun is you could just look at them now and just say you're not the boss of me okay <laughs> I do offer I do offer marriage counseling. For those who may need it, please call the office and speak with Tina. <laughs> but we don't control our circumstances. We like to think that we do, but we don't. And you know, the thing that we're going to see in Scripture time and time again is that when the power of God starts to move, Satan attacks and it's something that you will see time and time and time again yet for some reason we're surprised when it happens and we think wow if we were really doing what we needed to do Satan wouldn't attack can I tell you that the greater the power the greater the peril yes. Acts chapter 5 is where we begin this morning, verse 12. <coughs> the Bible says that the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. You have to remember where we left off last week with Ananias and Sapphira who came and they stood before the apostles and lied. And they didn't just lie to them, they lied to God. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And so there is this swift judgment that took place and Ananias and Sapphira both die right there. Now, we don't like to think about that because that's really inconvenient, right? I mean, after all, weren't they doing something good? I mean, you know, maybe they, they weren't gonna give the full amount of the, the value of the property that they had just sold, even though they said they were gonna do it. I mean, you know, they, they were going to give something, right? Here's the thing, is they were being deceptive. And you cannot deceive a holy God. And so when they are struck dead, people see it. And not only do people see it, but now word begins to spread about what's happening. And so there's this buzz around Jerusalem about all these things. And it says the apostles perform many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together. Now, I don't know if you remember, a few weeks ago we talked about this, this Greek word, homothumadon. Do you guys remember that? And how this word is not just like hanging out together, but this word uh, gives us the idea of this intent.
tense togetherness, this, this, this intensity that's there, that's inside them. That intensity is still there. It was through the day of Pentecost. It was uh, on the square after uh, Peter preached, and it continues to be with them now, this intense, intense desire, this almost this aggression that was inside them for the things of God, this, this, this intentionality and this aggression and this, this drive, maybe a better word, to see the kingdom of God advance. It is still there. It is still with them. And it says that they would meet together in one accord in the King James, it, that they would come together in one accord in Solomon's colonnade. Again, you have to understand that this is a prominent area on the Temple Mount that was the visible heart of the religious community. This move of God that is taking place is not taking place in the back alley. This move of God that is taking place is not in some obscure place that's out of the, the, the sun or the, the light of, of the community. It was right at the heart of the religious community. So this, this is taking place daily. Verse 13, it says, No one dared join them. Isn't that an interesting statement? I mean, the kingdom of God is moving forward, but the people who were observing and saw what was taking place didn't take it lightly. They had seen what had happened to Ananias and Sapphira, or they had heard about what had happened, and they are seeing these miracles take place in front of them. And they know that whoever these guys are locked into has some power. And so they weren't quick just to jump in and, and get in on the bandwagon. There was a holy fear that was there. And even though they were highly regarded by the people, no one dared to jump in and join them. But look at the next verse that Luke records. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Think about that for just a moment. Even though there was this aversion almost to just jump in and get involved with the apostles, there was this fear that was there that people looked at it and they didn't want to just jump in just all willy-nilly. Hey, that looks like fun. I'm going to go over there and hang out with those guys. Hey, that looks like some good stuff. No, there was a recognition that the God of creation was with those individuals and they weren't quick to just jump in. But look what it says. People were being saved all the time. The Lord was adding to their number as men and women believed in the Lord. Now, there's something else that, that can escape us if we're not really attentive that Luke gives us here, and it's those two words, men and women believed in the Lord. You have to understand this was not the norm of the day that women would be included. It was not the norm. God was doing something new. <laughs> As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns and around, around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by, un, by impure spirits. That, that word really means demoniac, demon-possessed people. And all of them were healed. You got to picture this scene as it unfolds. Can you put yourself there? Standing outside the temple on the Temple Mount, Solomon, Solomon's colonnade on this big porch area, the area where Gentiles were allowed to be. And these guys are just showing up and these incredible things are happening. And people are being healed and people are being set free by the power of God. Not by the power of the apostles, but the power of God that was at work in them. As they ministered in the name of Jesus or by the authority of Jesus. See, that's, that's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. means that you pray in the authority of His name. It's not some 
you know, incantation. It's not some magic phrase. It's not some hocus pocus, you know, abracadabra word. But when you pray in the name of Jesus, you are praying in the authority of his name, the name that is above every other name. And as they ministered, they ministered in the name of Jesus. As people were healed, they were healed by the authority of Jesus' name. And the Lord added to them daily. Verse 17, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Why were they jealous? They had it all together, right? They had it all figured out. They were in control of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of the day. They were the rulers. They were the ones in charge. Them and the Pharisees. Why? They were mad because their world was being turned upside down. That's why they were mad. Change is not comfortable. But God's not a God of comfort when it comes to you being comfortable. The Holy Spirit brings us comfort in our time of need, but he doesn't expect you to sit back in your lazy chair. Ooh. By these random, ragtag looking guys showing up in Solomon's colonnade, doing things that they didn't even believe in. And so they arrested the apostles, all 12 of them, and put them in the public jail. Interesting that they didn't put them in the, the jail of the Jews, the Sanhedrin. They didn't hold them there. They put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. What life? Life of freedom? Life of power. <laughs> Guys, all too often we read this and we just read it like, oh yeah, that's okay. And an angel shows up in the jail. Come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Are you guys with me? And an angel shows up in the jail. This is not like a Disney movie. This is a historical fact recorded in the most reliable ancient book ever written. This is a historical fact, y'all. An angel showed up in the jail with them and he sets them free, opens the cell, they go out and his instruction to them was to keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep doing what you're doing. How many of you remember we saw last week that they had already told Peter, don't go out and preach in this guy's name anymore. Don't go, don't go causing trouble. Don't go doing this. But what does he do? He keeps preaching the word. He keeps ministering to people. And the apostles continue to move the kingdom forward. And what does the angel say? Get back out there. Go again. Have you ever been in a place where maybe you played sports or maybe just in life, you're in a place where you thought, man, I just can't go anymore. I can't, I can't take the next step. I can't make the next rep. I can't run the next lap. I can't get up and go to work one more day. Why does God say get up and go do it again? Come on, keep going. Tell the people about this new life. Don't miss the irony of this moment. And it's this that the apostles were delivered by a force that the Sadducees didn't even believe existed. The Sadducees that put them in jail didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe angels even existed. And what does God do? He chooses a method that they don't even believe exists to show His power. <laughs> At daybreak, they entered the temple courts. They didn't wait, did they? They entered the temple courts just as they had been told and began to teach the people. And when the high priest and his, and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, which is the full assembly of elders in Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. 
But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find him there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what would this lead to? It was not acceptable to lose your prisoners. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. And at that, the captain went to his officers and brought the apostles with his officers and brought the apostles. And they did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Look at the shift that's happening. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross, and God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Now you're going to find a little bit later, Gamaliel shows up again. And we understand that he was Paul, the Apostle Paul, his teacher. 30, verse 35, Gamaliel addressed the Sanhedrin and he said, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. He's basically saying, hey, look, remember all these other guys that came along and caused the ruckus? That didn't, that didn't amount to anything. Don't worry about it. But, <laughs> this is one of the big buts in the Bible. But, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Hey, come on, y'all. It's not a big deal. Things come and go. This is just another fringe group trying to get their minute of fame. Or it could be God. Either way, it's not worth putting them in jail. It's not worth putting them to death. Verse 40, his speech persuaded them and they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Now, they've been in jail a couple of times. Now they're being flogged, beaten. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, <laughs> rejoicing, Somebody say re rejoicing. Would you say? I, I want you to get that. They were beaten and they left rejoicing. Why? Because they were fake? Why? Because they were phony? Why? Because they were going to fake it till they make it? No. It's because there was a reality on the inside of them that was driving their life and they understood that come hell or high water, I'm going to follow Jesus. Why? Because he is ultimately over all things. 
And they ordered them not to speak in Jesus' name, and they let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. For the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. That's powerful, y'all. It's not a bedtime story. That happened. And as real as this moment is with us sitting in this room, that was real. It happened. The question is why? Why? Why would they do that? I heard a story a few years ago shared by a gentleman that was a missionary evangelist for years. He told the story about going into a, an obscure village in Mexico to preach a revival at this little church. And when they finally got to this out of the way place, they were talking and, and uh, the town had quite a reputation for being a, a really bad place, crime ridden, uh, violent little place. And so the missionary evangelist is talking to the elders of the church and they're talking about how the church was founded and they told him about the pastor who planted that church, the pastor who founded that church. That he, with his wife and his young children, would load up on a little motorcycle and they would ride out from the city to this village. And as they would go out, people would throw rocks at them, throw bottles at them. They didn't want them there. But he continued to preach the gospel. And as he did, people started to be saved. The people that ran the town didn't like that. They didn't like what they saw. See, they didn't like to see the power of God at work. And so a few of them got together and they decided they were going to get rid of this guy. It's not going to keep happening. And so they come and they take him and they drag him out into the street in the center of town. And they're out there with their machetes and they tell him, you're going to either leave or we're going to take your head off. And they had a little conversation. And the pastor goes over. They had some concrete blocks set up. And he goes over and he gets down on his knees and he looks at them and he said, you can't take my head. I've already given it. And he laid his head on that block. As the men shared about that moment, they shared that the gentleman with the machetes pulled the machetes back, but they couldn't bring them down. And they stood there and their arms were shaking. And one after another, they couldn't do it. They couldn't come and they couldn't take his head. Time after time. Finally, they started to drop them on the ground. And the missionary evangelist looked at him and he said, guys, that's an incredible story. Did that really happen? I mean, is that real? And they said, yes, we were the five men. Why? Why would the apostles go back and face that peril, that danger, imminent danger? Why would the apostles do that. Why would that pastor do that? Why? Well, I can tell you some things that we learned in the book of Acts. There are a few things I'm just going to share with you quickly. Keep this in mind. We're witnessing the beginning of the church. We're witnessing the kingdom of God coming close to man. It's a charged environment. And we find the power of God being made manifest, made tangible. To feel it and to see it. That's what it means when we talk about something being manifest. You can see it. You can feel it. You can touch it. You can sense it. Here's the first thing. With great spiritual power comes great spiritual opposition. 
We like to talk about revival, revival fires. We like the parts where we jump and shout and sing. And, hey, that's bouncy. <laughs> Not for long, yeah. We like all that, right? Yeah. But do we understand that with great spiritual power, with a great move of God, comes opposition? We can watch with fascination as the early church did wonderful things. But are we ready to stand up to the enemy that faces us? How about in your own personal life? Revival begins in each one of us individually. Did you know that? I hear people say, Pastor, I long to see revival. How much are you praying? How much are you in your word? How open are you to the Holy Spirit changing you? Because he's not just going to come in here and just <sighs> sprinkle uh, revival dust on you and all of a sudden things are going to happen. Are you willing to walk in obedience to him and pursue him? Because I'm telling you, when great power comes, there's going to be great spiritual opposition. How many times have you been in a service where you really felt like the Lord touched you and gave you some freedom and you woke up the next morning and it was like all hell broke loose on you? What'd you do? I don't understand why God is letting me go through this. I don't understand why I'm going through it. I don't understand. Or... Do you go to your knees and say, though he slay me, yet will I serve you? Where does it drive you? Where does it drive you? If you don't understand that there's great opposition to a great move of God, then you're going to constantly be stuck in a place where you are frustrated and you are questioning and you're saying, God, are you even real? God, where are you? But when you settle in your heart that as you move forward in your faith that Satan is not going to be happy and he's going to attack you, then you can kind of reconcile that in your own heart and in your own mind and say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they tell me. I'm still going to serve the Lord. I'm still going to follow him. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. With rising power and the authority of true holiness and true love and true grace starts to work, it will puncture the underbelly of culture. And I'm going to say that again. When the rising power and the authority of true holiness, I'm not talking about legalism. Legalism is a way of thinking, it's a way of thinking. Where everything has to be a certain way. And sometimes what we do is we get truth and legalism confused. Can I tell you this morning? It's the true holiness that rises in you that will make a difference. Not your list of rules and regulations. Not what you think, but what does God's word say? It's when the power and the authority of true holiness, true love, and true grace punctures the underbelly of the culture that conflict will increase. But can I tell you this morning that great spiritual opposition will open the door for great spiritual victory. You can't have a great victory without a great battle. It's not going to happen. I'm going to tell you something. The devil does not want a powerful church in Lincoln County. I'm not just talking about hope. I'm talking about the church. Satan doesn't want a powerful church. Big C in Lincoln County. And if he can keep us 
Occupied with things that don't matter? Preoccupied with things that don't matter? You will never see a move of God in your lifetime. Why? Because you're not walking in homothumadon. You're not walking in the unity of the Spirit. You're not walking with an aggression to see God move and God work because you're still trying to prove that you're right. Churches across Lincoln County have been stuck in that for years. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because I grew up here. I'm not some person that doesn't know what I'm talking about. I know. And you know. That the only way to break the back of the enemy over this community is to be driven to your knees. It's the only way that it's going to happen. How are you going to respond to the attack of the enemy? I can tell you, I'm not going to give up. Are you going to give up? No. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep being obedient to God. Think about how you respond to the devil's attack on your life. Does it drive you to despair or does it drive you to your knees? Hmm. Let me tell you, when Satan can't stop the church from the outside with opposition, he will move inside with hypocrisy and superficiality. I pray that you're hearing what I'm saying. You have to understand we're in a battle. And it's not with each other. And it's not against flesh and blood. But it's about the enemy who will manipulate and use us and our good intentions to cause harm. And it comes with hypocrisy and superficiality. Why did the Apostle Paul say that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind? not to be conformed any longer to the pattern of the world. A pattern is superficial. A pattern is simply external. Conforming something to look a certain way. Conforming something to sound a certain way is the easy part. You can look the part on the outside and have never been changed on the inside. There's a form of godliness that denies the power of God. But can I tell you that the church of Jesus Christ has been hurt far more by hypocrisy, lukewarmness, and superficiality than by outside persecution. We're stirred by the, the stories of men who were willing to lay their life on the line, the physical life on the line. But what about people who are willing to lay their life down spiritually? I pray that we are never a church marked by people who are not willing to lay down anything and are always willing to take something. Because that's hypocrisy. That's... Superficiality. And I tell you this morning that when you choose faith over fear, God will give you greater boldness to stand for His truth, to obey God rather than man. And back in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, as Peter stands before the Sanhedrin, he says this to them. He asks them a question Should we obey God or man? When they're telling him, you know, don't go preach anymore in this name, Jesus. He says, should we obey God or man? But something has happened between chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now Peter, standing there, makes this statement. We must obey God rather than man. It's not a question anymore. It's a statement. Boldness is continuing to rise in his life. Can I tell you that our obedience to God must be informed. Informed obedience. You have to know what it is that God desires you to do. Verse 17, the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles, put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors in the jail and brought them out 
and told them, Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. There was a clarity in their direction. They understood what God wanted them to do. Their obedience was not just obedient to some you know, whatever willy-nilly thing that they dreamt up. This was obedience to the will of God, to the plan of God, to the purpose of God for their life. What is God's plan for your life? What's He want you to do? What's He want you to do? What has He spoken to you about how you need to live for Him? Not some list of rules and regulations that somebody else has given you to say, hey, if you, if you go down and you check the boxes, you're going to be holy. If you go down and you check the boxes, you're going to be godly. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what has God spoken to you in His Word? What is it that is the conviction of your life that is driving you every day to be more like Him? The apostles had a command from God. Can I tell you that all true obedience is informed obedience? You must hear from God in order to obey Him. God never promised to bless any endeavor that He has not commanded. I don't understand why this just isn't working. I don't understand this. How often do we stop and say, God, is this what you even want me to do? God, where do you want me? I think most of the time we're driven much more by our own desires than God's desires for us. Not only does our obedience need to be informed, but our obedience has to be intentional. You have to do it on purpose. You have to be intentional. Doing right is not merely abstaining from doing wrong. Last week I shared with you that we need to be for something, not against everything. That's an attitude of the way that you live your life. All of my life I've been around people growing up and in ministry life and college all the time around people who want to tell you everything they're against. How about what you're for? How about that becomes the barometer of your life? How about that becomes the thing that guides you? What you're living for. Who you're living for. Not who you're living against. I know, listen. Satan is real. Sin is real. It will send you to hell. Choosing that life will send you there. God never intended for you to be there. That's why Jesus came. But can I tell you that at some point you've got to have something to live for? I don't do that. 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 What do you do? I don't do that. That's what I do. Obedience has to be intentional. You have to do things on purpose. Doing right is not merely abstaining from doing wrong. The apostles wanted to know the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you hearing Him? It's a lot easier to follow rules than it is to follow Jesus. Because you don't have to hear Him to follow rules. Our obedience must be immediate obedience. We see it in verses 28, 29, 30, 31. The apostles responded immediately. Verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to teach in His name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. What the apostles do, they immediately began preaching again once they were freed from prison.
When it comes to following God, procrastination is a form of disobedience. God tells you to do something and you say, eh, I'll get around to it. That's disobedience. What are some things that God tells you? What are some things that He tells you in His Word? Be holy for I am holy. Love your enemies. Pursue love. That's His will. That's His will. People will say, well, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what His will is. I'm telling you that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And when you begin to walk in the will that He's already established in His Word, He will lead you to the next thing. But if you're not willing to do what He said there, you're not willing to be obedient to what is clear in print, in black and white and red, you can't expect that you're going to be able to walk with Him or that you're going to hear His voice. If you're not putting yourself in a place where you can hear Him. Can I tell you that the best time to do the will of God is when you're aware that God wants it done. Yeah. Don't put it off. What does the Bible tell us? Today is the day of salvation. Don't, don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. Don't keep pushing it away. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot. There have been times that I have felt that God wanted us to do something in ministry and it didn't make sense to me. Did not make sense. At all. <laughs> I didn't understand it fully. But I knew it was what we were supposed to do. And so we tried to obey. Can I tell you, there have been times in my life I have missed the obedience part. I may miss it again. I don't intentionally want to. But I could. <laughs> Why? 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 Do you go into that community and start the church? Why do you do that? I love Psalm 11960. It's not on the screen, but just listen to what it says. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Fred, would you join me as I close this morning? Great power will bring peril into your life. Great power will bring conflict from the enemy into your life. <coughs> Sometimes the greatest enemy is yourself. When Satan can't use what's on the outside to get you, he'll do some things on the inside. Hypocrisy, self-righteousness, all of those things. You know, you know what's interesting to me is people that I have met throughout my life who truly were great in the kingdom of God, who were truly righteous people, didn't tell you how righteous they were. I think of a, a lady that I had the opportunity to sit with when I was a youth pastor, 20, 22 years old, 21 years old. And I would sit on her front porch with her. Her name was Mamie Williams. Sister Mamie was one of the pioneers of the, the faith in the Pentecostal movement. At the time that I knew her, in the mid-90s, she was about 90 years old. She was a woman that was just an incredible lady. Really. As a young woman, she did not know Christ. She didn't serve the Lord. She didn't follow Him. Got married, had a child. 
And in her early 20s, she came to know Jesus, saved. And her husband didn't like it. And he told her, I didn't marry a Bible thumper, and I don't intend on being married to a Bible thumper. Sister Mamie had a decision to make, and it wasn't, you know, just, I got to get my husband in church. But the decision she had to make was, am I still going to serve Him? Am I still going to serve God? She continued to serve the Lord and grow in grace. She continued to be obedient to do what God told her to do in His Word. And as she became more like Christ, her husband became more antagonistic. Eventually, he left her. So I'm not going to live like this. I'm not going to live with somebody that's always talking about God. He had to make his own choice, didn't he? But he left Sister Mamie with her little boy. They lived there close to the church. And one afternoon, her son, little boy, was out playing. Ball rolled out into the road, and a car came and hit him. And the little boy died. She held him in the road as he died. What's she going to do? Her husband's gone. Now her baby's gone. God, where are you? I thought if I followed you, everything was going to be great. God, I wanted you to use me in power. God, I wanted you to work through me. Sister Mamie buried her son and continued to be obedient to Jesus. She became a missionary with the Assemblies of God, a pioneer missionary, went to the Philippines, preached all over the Philippines. This was a long time ago, y'all. This was before the Women's Live Movement. She wasn't this tall. When I knew her, she was almost bald. She had a wig. And being a good Pentecostal woman, she had a bun on top of her wig. <laughs> Back in the days when I was a boy, I remember some services where you knew you had a good service if, if the women got to shouting and their hair fell. Bobby pins all over the floor. Make, makes me want to go like this, Fred. <laughs> So we had church. You had church when I was youth pastor when you saw Sister Mamie's bun fall off her head. Bobby pins all over the floor. Now let me tell you something. There was something at work in her that was powerful. She shared stories with me of standing on a makeshift stage in the Philippines and the witch doctors coming against her threatening to take her life. But she still went. Why? Because she was obedient. That's why. That's why. Witch doctors being saved and entire villages coming to know Jesus. And you know what? There's no movies made about her. But there are countless individuals that God has used to advance His kingdom that you'll never read a book about and you'll never see a movie about them. Because it's not about that. She came back to the States from being a missionary and she pastored the church that I was the youth pastor at for probably 10, 15 years through the 50s. Revival broke out there. Healing revival. They were bringing people from Tampa General Hospital on stretchers in ambulances to the church to be prayed for and they were being healed right there. It was a move of God. An outpouring of His Spirit. And I remember sitting with her on her front porch as an 80, 90 year old woman. Talk about the power of God. 
She laid hands on me one day and was praying for me. And she spoke prophetically over my life. And she said, God's going to give you a city. God's going to give you a city. Several years later, I was preaching a crusade. Seven, no, five night crusade in Caracas, Venezuela before Chavez shut everything down. Church was in revival. There were about 10,000 people in the church every night. We had a different group of people. 2,000, 2,500 people each night. The last night of that crusade, the pastor of the church came to me. He prayed over me and through the interpreting, interpreter spoke prophetically over my life and he said, God's going to give you a city. Throughout my life in ministry, I've tried to be obedient to the Lord. Why? 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 Because He gave His life for me. And the most I can do, best I can do, Why do you serve Jesus? So I can be powerful. So I can pray. So I can see miracles. No, 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 no. Serve him for the same reason Mamie did. Because he saved her. He died for her. Would you stand with me? At the end of the day, you serve the one who guarantees victory. If you have faith to believe it. Your life, just like Peter, is going to cast a shadow. It's going to cast a shadow on the people that you come in contact with. The question is, what shadow are you going to cast? If the light of the gospel, the light of grace and the love of God is in you, you'll cast a shadow of hope and healing on the lives of those you cross. Or, if His life, if His, if his grace, His mercy and His love are behind you, they're not in you, they're not with you, if they're behind you, all you're going to do is block His light from reaching other people. What do you want this morning? What do you, what do you want? <clears throat> you want great power in your life? You've got to deal with peril. Imminent resistance. I want to pray over you. Father, today, I pray that Your Word would find root in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Lord, that we would choose today to be obedient to You. That we would ask, ask ourselves that question, why? Why do I serve? Why do I give? Why do I come to church? I pray that the answer is because You first loved us. And as we ask that question, why? And we answer that question, why? I pray that we would be obedient to do what you've called us to do. Not expecting some great return, but to simply obey you. And I thank you for what you're going to do in this place. I thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray this over each person in this room today and each person that will watch online. It's in your name, Jesus, we ask it. Amen.